Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. Wow. I it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Bianca Jones Marlin. It was recorded in March 2015 at Littlefield in Brooklyn. So I graduated with a dual bachelor's degree in biology and adolescent education. I was on a full academic scholarship. And uh, when I graduated, I got the Distinguished Student Leader Award for my service as the president of the student government. In between that time, I did research at MIT and Harvard, and I presented that work at Yale and uh, at Vanderbilt University. And let's see what else, I play the clarinet. Uh, (laughs) And when I started applying to graduate schools, I sent my application to a few schools, and I um, I I was asked for interviews at Ivy Leagues, and there were financial incentives from um, schools on the West Coast. And I chose to start my PhD at New York University School of Medicine studying neurobiology and physiology. And I remember the first day of graduate school. We all came in, all the first years, just as equally proud, I think, as I was and excited to finally be here after the applications, after the summers and late hours, and after being pre-med, we're finally here until we're here for six years. We're still finally here. And we gathered around the bar and we started chatting just as, cl- as colleagues, learning about the other individuals, figuring out what, where, their ca- where they came from, what their story was. And so we're surrounded by the bar, and I'm there, just as equally excited to hear about my, my new friends, see who, who you're going to date, who you're going to be friends with, just doing that whole circle. <laughs> I married one of them. But, um, <laughs> uh, and as we're talking, and it came to my turn to talk about my, my past and how I got here at NYU, a student interjected and he said, oh, well, I mean, it's obvious why Bianca's here at NYU. It's because she's black. Oh, here we go. Okay. So what do I say next? Because this is a slightly awkward situation. And if my mind was quick, I had seven or eight things by the time I walked out. I wish I would have said this. I should have said that. But what I did say is something along the lines of uh, 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 private universities don't have affirmative action. I have no clue if that's true, by the way. I just, it's the first thing that came to my mind. And I moonwalked out of that conversation before my face started to sting and before I looked a little bit too frazzled. And on my way out, as I walked out past the bar and past the door, I took a uh, survey of the room. And there were six generations of graduate students, six. And I was one of two black people in the room. And that quota was about to be cut in half because I was going home. And so just looking at that, observing that, I started to think, after all the things I've done, maybe in this situation, they become null and void. Maybe I am just filling a quota because there's obviously a lack. My love for science doesn't really have a birthday. Um, as far as what my family tells me, I was always like that dirty kid. My bifocals are squished up against the tree trunk, trying to see what's going on inside. I was always picking up stones, collecting the uh, bugs from underneath the stones. Yeah, my mom's here, that's her laughing because she knows it's true. <laughs> digging for toads and snakes in her garden, um, and I'd bring them back to my laboratory. And my laboratory was my bedroom, so yeah, to my mom's chagrin. And my, my sisters, my brother, my brother did show choir, 
My sisters studied art, and they were in beauty pageants. I, however, I volunteered to swab the marching band floor for fungal spores in both the brass section and the woodwind section <laughs> to see if, the, if fungal spores were accumulating in the spit when the spit dripped out. <laughs> Yeah, so if, if it's nature versus nurture, my, my, my genes were, uh, were straight on the road for nerdum. But my nature def, def, uh, nurture definitely did play a role as well, and that's for my love of neurobiology. I grew up one of roughly, let's give or take, 50 children. My parents, two of the most noblest people um, you'll ever meet if you ever do get to meet them, uh, are foster parents. They're my biological parents, but I have many foster brothers and sisters. And I think my definition of sibling was different from the world's definition of sibling at the time. Because my definition of sibling was anyone who calls my mom and dad, mom and dad, are my sibling. And so when my brother would go out and introduce me to his friends, and he'd say, oh, this is my sister Bianca, and they'd look at me. And then they'd look at him. They'd look at his blonde hair, blue eyes, and look back at me. And they'd wait for us to say we're kidding, but we, we weren't. Uh, one of my sisters, this is, yeah, one of my sisters, uh, there was one time where we said, we're going to go to Burger King. So we're going to collect $3 in change. There's a lot of kids in the house. There's a lot of change running around. We were able to collect $3, get on our bike, and we were going to go to Burger King and treat ourselves to a nice, a nice treat. So we get on the bike, and on the way there, immediately we're stopped by this beautiful new opening, grand opening, and the banner said, Pet Shop. So instead of going to Burger King, we diverted in there into the pet shop and walked out with a pet mouse and still enough change to get french fries. <laughs> and so we snuck back in and we MacGyvered our way back into the bedroom because with seven kids at one time in the house, it's really easy to get in and out um, undetected. And we put the mouse uh, underneath our bed in a shoe box. And the next morning, we woke up, opened up the cage, and we realized that uh, the mouse had a family that was just as big as ours. <laughs> the week went by, and we were able to maintain this small colony. And <laughs> towards the end of the week, when we went back to check out the, uh, the mouse, we saw that the mom was missing. And it could have been the fact that we couldn't find the mouse, we may have chewed through, or a series of other things. But this caused something to, uh, to break in my, in my sister's um, behavior. And through a series of like loud noises and stuff, by the time my mom came in, she was able to pull her off of me. But I took the hits. I took the hits because I knew the hits that she took. I mean, my siblings, both foster siblings and, um, and biological siblings get it. Because I grew up in Long Island. And so throughout the day, um, the Long Island suburban paradise is lovely. We went to, to uh, Splish Splash on the weekends. We had a trampoline. We had a pool. We lived life to the fullest. We would spend nights outside on the trampoline and say, we're going to tent, we're going to build a tent, and we're going to stay out here. And then we would look up at the stars, and it was beautiful. And so you started to see that thing circling. That thing was a bat. And then you went back inside, <laughs> and you decided <laughs> you're not brave enough to spend the night outside. But at night, when I would hang over my bunk bed and speak to... Uh, my siblings, I would hear the other stories. I would hear the stories of their life before they came into our home. I would hear the stories that stripped them of self-respect, that stripped them of a future, and that crushed their souls based on someone else's actions. And a few of my, um, my, my colleagues now in lab, we joke that my mom induces cortical plasticity <laughs> because my mom took people potentially would have been broken. And through love, and through motivation, and through respect, made them into individuals who could go out and do the same for other people. I study right now the neuromodulator oxytocin, it's known as the love hormone, um, in caregivers. So mothers who don't treat their pups well, I've added oxytocin to their brain, and I've seen two things. It changes the brain signature from that of a a bad mom to that of a good mom. And it also changes the behavior so the animal starts to care for her pups better. I know that my foster siblings taught me, uh, or I guess brought me to neuroscience in two ways. Yes, I study social care, and yes, I study maternal behavior, and I'm assuming that based on the security, the security um, nature, nature of my life that that's probably where I got here. But they've also taught me another thing. They taught me that 
I can surround myself with positivity. And I can surround myself with people who believe in me. And I can surround myself with scientists who respect my scientific prowess and will, cannot help but to put their biases aside based on the data that I collect. And so now I'm a sixth year in the program. I defend my thesis in two and a half weeks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, after a series of happy hours and classes and um, you know, papers accepted, papers not accepted, past tests and not so past tests, my group, my cohort from, from six years ago, we, meet up, we met up for, uh, for drinks, actually to um, welcome the new first years in. And that same student, who is now my colleague and I would call her friend, came and we started chatting about what he's doing next in life. And he started sharing with me some of his insecurities. He went to a state school. His mom was a single mom, couldn't afford to send him to a, a more expensive school. Now that he's going out in the job market, he's a little bit nervous about the fact that his, his resume doesn't read as well as others. And it was in this situation that I was able to share my feelings with him. I was able to say, you know, I actually have my own insecurities as well. Insecurities that he didn't even know probably that he had catalyzed. That sometimes I feel like I'm thrown into a new, whole different family and I sit with that paranoia that if I'm presenting my data, the first thought that's coming out is, well, I'm giving you a free pass and you're here because you're black, not because you deserved it. And just as much as the words that he spoke to me six years ago changed the way I approached graduate school, the words that he spoke to me then and there also did. And what he said to me is, Bianca, come on. Everyone knows you're smart and you deserve to be here. Thank you. That was Bianca Jones Marlin. Bianca is a neuroscientist and doctoral candidate at New York University School of Medicine. She investigates how the brain changes in the presence of the love hormone, oxytocin. Her research aims to understand the vital bond between mother and child and uses oxytocin as a treatment in strengthening fragile and broken parental relationships. A native New Yorker, she lives in Manhattan with her scientist husband, Joe, and their cat, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who was named after the famous neuroanatomist. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Avalith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show, and to Bianca's mother, who came to the show and is indeed awesome. Thanks for listening. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out, and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets. Spicy or classic for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba.